Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today's talk will be on something called metastability and we will see that some methods developed in Los Alamos are important for the study of this phenomenon. So let me start by explaining what metastability is. And here is an example that you find uh, online, so the video is not by me, you have the link here. And it's called super cold water. So what you do is that you take a bottle of water and you put it in the freezer for quite some time. And if the water is clean enough, pure enough, even when its temperature is below freezing, it can still remain liquid. So here you see that this super cooled water is liquid when you pour it. However, in the process of pouring, it turns into slush, into some kind of ice. So what happens here is that in order to make the phase transition from liquid water to ice, the water has to overcome some energy barrier. And when the water is not moving in the bottle, it lacks the energy to form this ice, while when you pour it, you actually give it enough energy. And you can find a lot of funny videos on YouTube if you look for super cold water. You apparently can do it with beer too and other liquids. So metastability refers to the fact that a system can remain for very long time spans in a state which is not its equilibrium state as predicted by thermodynamics because of this existence of an energy barrier. Now here is a second example which is called the easing model and I will describe it in more detail a bit later on but it's a model for a magnet and a magnet that is constituted of spins. So let's say the yellow squares are up spins, the blue squares are down spins. And my system here has been put in a magnetic field that favors the up spins. So the equilibrium state actually has mostly yellow uh, squares. However, I started in a state with mostly blue squares. And what you see here is that it takes some, quite some time for the system to reach its equilibrium state with uh, mostly yellow spins. So again, here we have a phase transition, which is a phase transition between positive and negative magnetic field in a, in a magnet. And we have prepared the state in a, one equilibrium state, then we have changed rather quickly the magnetic field and the system stays for a long time in a state which is not its equilibrium state and which is called a metastable state. So here the temperature is quite low so at the end the system reaches a state where most spins are yellow. Now here's a more complicated example of interacting particles. So they interact with the Lennard-Jones potential but modified as to be non-isotropic. And here I actually am not sure there is metastability in this example because I don't know whether there is a phase transition. But at least what you see is that the system is not really at equilibrium. It keeps moving quite a lot, so one could imagine that the equilibrium state would be some kind of regular lattice, but the system is not really able of finding such a regular configuration. And one more example here. Uh, for this, I know that there's some analog of a phase transition that is a stochastic partial differential equation, which is again a model for a magnet, except that now we have spins given by this phi that instead of taking just values 1 and minus 1, take all possible real values, but they tend to be close to 1 or minus 1. 
And here this term a cos epsilon t is a magnetic field which in this case changes periodically in time. And you see that the system reacts to changes in the magnetic field but with some delay. Right now the magnetic field is positive and the system is becoming so mostly uh, positively magnetized. But now the magnetic field is actually quite negative and it takes some time for these blue drops to form and the system to turn into a state with mostly negative magnetization. And you see that you have some kind of hysteresis phenomenon, meaning that there between the magnetic field you see on the horizontal axis here and the magnetization you see on the vertical axis, there's some kind of delay. So the current value of the magnetic field of the magnetization does not is not given directly in terms of the magnetic field, but it depends on what happened before the system. So let me now explain this easing model in more details. So that is a quite simple model for a ferromagnet, but it's a very well studied model and uh, it's useful to understand what happens. So here I take a certain domain. So here I'm in dimension two in the plane. So I have a certain rectangular box in the plane. And the box is divided into lattice points, which represent the atoms in a lattice of atoms. And at each point I have a spin, which represents the magnetic moment of typically valence electrons of these atoms. And the spins here take either the value plus one or the value minus one. Now, a configuration that is the set of all these spin values here. To this configuration, we will associate an energy, which is given by the following expression. So we have two terms here. The first term is a sum over all neighbors Rj. So this Ij between brackets means that I and J are neighboring lattice points. And I take the product sigma i sigma j, I sum over all neighbors and I multiply by minus a constant capital J. And the second term is an interaction term with an external magnetic field. So here I take the sum of all spins, which is the magnetization, and I multiply by lowercase h, which is the magnetic field. Now let us rewrite this expression in a slightly different way. So first of all, this sigma i sigma j has value one if the spin sigma a, i and sigma j are the same and minus one if they're different. So the sum is actually the number of pairs of neighbors which have the same spin minus the number of pairs that have a different spin. And for the second sum here, well, this is simply the number of plus spins minus the number of minus spins. Now, the neighbors which are different, you can represent here in the picture by these purple segments, which are called interfaces, so which are between neighbors of different sign. Now, you can now observe that the number of neighbors which are the same is actually the total number of neighbors minus the number of neighbors which are different. So I can rewrite this first term like this. And also I can say that the number of minus spins is the total number of spins minus the number of plus spins. So I can rewrite the second term like this. Now the number of links and the number of spins are constant in the model, so I can put all this in a constant H0. And then I get two important terms here. So the first term is proportional to the number of different neighbors. So the total length of the purple interface here, that's called the interface term. And the second term here is minus 2H times the number of plus spins, and that is called a bulk term. 
So you see that assuming J is positive, then we say that we have a ferromagnet. We see that if the length of interfaces increases, that increases the energy. And if, for instance, the magnetic field is positive, the more plus spins I have, the lower the energy will be. So you can have a competition between these two terms, depending on the signs of J and H. Now, the main uh, thing we will be interested in is called the magnetization, and that is just the sum of all spins. We can, if we want, normalize this by dividing it, dividing it by the number of spins, but that is not really necessary here. And then statistical physics tells us that at equilibrium at temperature T, the probability of the system being in state sigma, P of sigma, is given by this expression here. So I have exponential minus beta H of sigma, and beta is 1 over Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. So the lower the temperature, the larger beta will be. And the z here is just a normalization constant that you need to have a pro probability measure. So the sum of the probabilities over all configurations should be 1. So z is given by the sum here. And statistical physics tells us that when the system is at equilibrium at certain temperature t, then the magnetization will be given by uh, this expected value under the Gibbs measure of m, which is just the sum here that I can also rewrite directly in terms of the Gibbs measure, so the Hamiltonian and the normalization. And now we know quite a lot on the system, so a first result that was proved by Ernst Ising, who was the first to study this uh, model that was proposed to him by his advisor Lenz, is that there's no phase transition in dimension one. And we will see what that means in more detail. And actually Ising uh, incorrectly concluded that also in higher dimensions there will be no phase transition. However, later on, Rudolf Piles proved that there is actually a phase transition in two dimensions and also in higher dimensions. And later on, Lars Onsager was able to solve the easing model for zero magnetic field in the sense that he found expressions for the free energy and the spontaneous magnetization, although proofs of these results uh, came a bit later with people like Lee. Now, what do I mean by these terms? So here I have what I call a, what we call a phase diagram. So let's put the temperature on the x-axis and the magnetic field on the y-axis. And the red line here denotes a first order phase transition. So what this means is that you can show that for negative magnetic field, the magnetization is negative. For positive magnetic field, it is positive. But then when you let the magnetic field go to zero, if the temperature is below a certain critical temperature, Tc, then the magnetization will not go to zero. It will go to a positive value, while from below it will go to a negative value. So that is this spontaneous magnetization. So this red line is called a first order phase transition because a certain quantity here, the magnetization is discontinuous. And if you have no magnetic field and you increase the temperature, you have what's called a second order phase transition, which is not discontinuous, meaning the spontaneous magnetization actually goes continuously to zero as you approach Tc and above it is equal to zero. So here are other uh, representations of what this spontaneous magnetization is. So here we plot the 
expected magnetization in terms of the magnetic field for low and high temperatures. And you see what I said about the sign of uh, the magnetization being the same as the sign of the magnetic field. But for temperatures below the critical temperature, as H goes to zero, from above the magnetization converges to this H star, which is positive, which is the spontaneous magnetization, while from below it converges to minus H star. On the other hand, when the temperature is larger than the critical value, the magnetization varies continuously with the magnetic field. So these are results that one can pro prove. They have been proven by different people and there are many refinements, but it is quite uh, a lot of work to prove this. And you may want also to look at this system by doing numerical simulations or maybe other systems that are more complicated that you're not able to solve analytically. And then you encounter a major problem, which is the following. So remember for the magnetization, I have to compute this expectation here. And if there are n spins, the number of configurations is 2 to the n. And as soon as n is a few hundreds or thousands, that is a huge number of terms, so it is not practical to compute this sum. And also, you see what is called the curse of dimensionality, which means that if you increase the dimension of the lattice, so for instance, you go from dimension 2 to dimension 3, for a certain sample size, you increase dramatically the number of spins and even more the number of terms in this sum. So people have been looking for ways of estimating this expectation without having to compute all the terms in this sum. And one set of methods that have been used are called Monte Carlo methods. And here I have put uh, the pictures of a number of scientists that are associated with that, even though there are many more that have been working on that. So maybe the first one to experiment with this so-called Monte Carlo methods is uh, Enrico Fermi in the 1930s. And later on, in the 1940s, uh, Stanislav Ulam, who was uh, in Los Alamos at the time, and he was working on modeling neutron diffusions, which was something that needed to be understood uh, for the Manhattan Project, so to, to construct an atomic bomb. And he was the, the first to really de develop these algorithms in more detail, and then with John von Neumann, they uh, implemented that on a, on a computer, on one of the first computers. So you see here why this kind of study is associated with Los Alamos. Now, what is a Monte Carlo method? Well, the idea is that instead of computing this expected magnetization by trying to carry out the sum over a huge number of terms, what you do is that you generate independent random variables that have this Gibbs distribution P, proportional to exponential minus beta H. And then you take uh, what is called an empirical average of uh, these random variables. And that, by the law of large numbers, will converge as n grows to uh, the expectation with high probability. And the point is that, in general, this n ha doesn't have to be comparable to the number of configurations. It can be much smaller, and also it doesn't depend so much on the dimension of your system. Now, there are particular cases where one knows how to generate these random variables. For instance, if 
you put some order on your states of the system and you know the distribution functions so which give you the probability of uh, your so of, of a certain uh, number of uh, configurations in your order then there's a way of simulating such a random variable but the problem is that in cases like the easing model we don't have i mean it, uh, computing this distribution function is as difficult as computing the sum over all sigmas so you need another idea and the idea that different people had is to use uh, what is called MC, an mcmc method so uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo method to generate these MI. And the probably most influential article that really developed this method and gave a very precise algorithm for making the computation is the following article here by Nicolas Metropolis, uh, so Adriana Rosenbluth, Marshall Rosenbluth, Edward Teller, and Augusta Teller. And Edward Teller, if you have watched the movie Oppenheimer, you know who he is. He is in general known as uh, the inventor of the hydrogen bomb. And it appears that there's some controversy uh, on what are the contributions of these different people to that paper. Actually, because Metropolis was the first author of the paper, this method, this algorithm is often called Metropolis algorithm. And sometimes also Metropolis Hastings, because later in the 1970s, Hastings uh, found a generalization. But according to some accounts, what happened is that mostly uh, Edward Teller had some important ideas and Augusta Teller developed the first version of the code for that. But then the Rosenbluth uh, joined the team and the most work seems to have been done by them. And in particular, Ariana Rosenbluth rewrote the whole computer code from scratch uh, to implement the algorithm. And the contribution by Metropolis apparently was mainly to give them computer time on uh, one of the first big computers, Maniac, that uh, he was supervising. So Metropolis did some contributions with Ulam on the Monte Carlo method, but for this particular method, it is a bit unjustified that he gets all the credit for developing it. Now, what is this algorithm? So. There are different variants depending on the system you're interested in, but let me talk about a particular case which works for the easing model. So the general idea, as I said, is to generate the random variables mi via a Markov chain that has the Gibbs measure as an invariant measure. Now, one way of doing that is to ask that the transition probabilities so the probability that your Markov chain goes from state sigma to state sigma prime satisfy the following so-called detailed balance condition, also called reversibility and uh, probability, which says that the probability to go from sigma to sigma prime times the invariant measure of sigma is equal to the symmetric term uh, for the reverse transition. So if this relation is satisfied, you can quite easily show that the invariant measure will be the Gibbs measure. And it's much easier to build, uh, to construct these P sigma sigma prime when you ask for this relation to be satisfied. Now, for Glauber dynamics, what you say is that, you say that the transition probability between sigma and sigma prime will be non-zero only if you flip exactly one spin between configurations sigma and sigma prime. 
So in practice, what you do is the following. So you choose at each time step one lattice point i uniformly at random. And then you compute the new energy that the system would have if you flip the ith spin. And then you do one of two things. Either the energy has decreased and then you indeed flip the spin number i, or the energy has increased and then you accept the transition with a probability exponential minus beta the energy difference and otherwise you don't do anything. And then if you compute the average value of the magnetization over n time steps and n is large enough, you will have an estimate of your magnetization. So let's look at uh, some simulations of this algorithm. So here's a case with a relatively large temperature. And what you see here is it's similar to the simulation I showed before. You have these uh, spins that randomly change. And in this case, the system is quite disordered. So that doesn't seem to be any stabilization except maybe in distribution and probability. But if you run this simulation over a certain time and you take averages of the magnetization, you will get an estimate of the quantity expected magnetization that you want to estimate. Now let's look at what happens when we decrease the temperature. So here the temperature is a little bit smaller, so we see that the time evolution is a little bit less disordered. You see that we get larger drops, actually, larger clusters of plus spins that form. And here we are probably below the critical temperature because the system ultimately reaches a state with uh, mostly plus spins. Now here I have decreased the temperature even more and actually I also had to speed up the, the movie. So the number of Monte Carlo steps between frames is larger here than before. And now you see that the system is even more ordered. So you really have these large yellow drops that are created and uh, very few isolated plus spins. And after a while, the region with plus spins has become so large that it quite quickly invades the remaining space. And if I decrease the temperature even more. So here we start getting into what is the metastable regime. So you see here the system has trouble creating plus spins. So every now and then a few spins have become positive but then they become negative again until there are these uh, droplets that manage to form and their shape is quite close to a square or a rectangle which is very close to a square. So it takes a while for these drops to appear. And then when I have they have reached a certain size, they start growing faster. And now you see that we have reached a point where these drops are large enough that they are able to to join and uh, to invade the whole space. So here we are in a metastable regime because it takes quite some time for the, the system to uh, reach the, the stable state. Uh, and remember I have s uh, speeded up time so uh, and even more than in the previous simulation. So I think by a factor 100 or something like that. And uh, so that is a manifestation of metastability. Now let us 
try to understand a bit more in detail what happens. So the idea is that if the temperature is very small, the system to make a transition from the initial state here, where all spins are negative, to a state with a mostly positive spins, somehow has to increase the energy, but it wants to do it in a, in a way that increases the energy as little as possible. So if I start with this configuration here, all spins minus one, I have the certain energy H naught. And now when I flip one spin, remember I had this interface and bulk term. So the interface term is eight J because there are four interfaces and the bulk term is minus two H. So if 8j is larger than 2h, the energy has increased. Now, if we flip a second spin and it's far away, the energy increases even more to h0 plus 16j minus 4h. But we can actually do better because if I flip here a spin which is next to the first one, Instead of 16j, I have 12j because the length of the interface of the boundary is 6 instead of 8. And in a similar spirit, if I flip more spins, if I do it like this, I get something larger than if I do it by creating a square. So you see that this one has a smaller energy because the boundary is has a smaller length. Now, for a larger droplet of size 3 by 3, uh, this is the energy. And let us look at what happens now if we increase the size of the droplet. So we cannot avoid increasing the, the energy. So if I add another plus spin here, I have added two interfaces and I have one more plus spin so I have decreased the bulk term but increased the interface term. But now if I flip a spin next to this one I actually do not increase the interface term and the bulk term decreases and similarly at the next step. And then I have to add a new row and so here I have increased again the interface term, but then the interface term remains constant until I have reached a droplet of size four by four. So here's a graph of what happens for the particular case where J is equal to one and H is equal to one half. So we started with one flipped spin, then two spins next to each other then we flip a third spin, so here the energy has increased. But now, when I complete this to a 2 by 2 square, the energy decreases. And then each time I add a, a row, the energy de increases again, and then decreases when I reach a square or rectangular configuration. And what you see here is that after a while, the phases where you decrease the energy become longer and finally the energy decrease wins. So the idea is that uh, the system cannot avoid going through a state of larger energy which so here the maximal energy is reached on uh, a few states he up here but ultimately the energy will decrease. And so what takes time is to reach the configuration here with the maximal energy. Now, what happens for larger system size is that you can compute the energy of a square drop of size L by L. So here the energy difference is given by a boundary term, an interface term, 8J times L minus a bulk term 2h times l squared. 
And if you plot this as a function of L, you see first this increase and then a decrease. So this, the maximal energy here, which has this expression here, hj square over h, that is called the activation energy. So it's the energy you cannot avoid reaching to uh, finally go to uh, states with lower energy. And here's just one example of the type of results people have shown. So here's a result by Neves and Schonmann from the 1990s, which says that if beta is very large, so the temperature is very small, the mean metastable lifetime, which is the expected time you need to go from the all minus to a mostly plus configuration, behaves like exponential beta times this energy barrier. So this is called an Arrhenius type law and it governs many metastable phenomena. And the other statement here says that during such a transition, the system will visit the square drop of maximal size here to J over H with a probability going to one as beta goes to infinity. So almost surely as temperature goes to zero, the system will go through this critical droplet, which has the maximal energy. Now, since these papers, there have been a lot of refinements, so many mathematicians have been working on finding sharper estimates for this time here, other properties and generalizing this to other models. So here is a review article that contains uh, some of those. And to stress it again, so the link with metastability is that this time you need to go from the metastable to the stable state becomes very large depending on a parameter of the system, which is here the inverse temperature. So that's it for this talk on metastability. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks a lot for watching and I hope to see you again soon. Take care. Bye.